I am actually not alone in this intro, but I will speak to our our guest here momentarily. Uh, So what we've got here, actually, this is our playthrough that we did quite a few years ago now of Pugmire. Myself and Jake and Tass, we did this as Patreon content. Um, And every now and then we like to kind of dole out some of the Patreon content for everybody to hear. And um, part of the reason that this is coming out now is because uh, we have got Eddie Webb here with us. Uh, Eddie Webb is the creator of Pugmire. Uh, He's also the voice you'll hear running us through as we play Pugmire. And there's quite a few things for us to talk about because since we've played Pugmire, we played an OG Pugmire, and now there is Pugmire Realms. Can you talk to us a a little bit about the difference between those two? Totally. Um, So, yeah, Pugmire is kind of the, the, like better term, the first edition of the game. Um, And it was very much, the idea was, was kind of, Something that's very close to Dungeons and Dragons, but with dogs. It wasn't quite the same. I always intended it to be kind of more of a streamlined version, uh, a version that people who remember playing D and D back in the day but haven't played in a while, the, the versions in their head or the versions we understand culturally rather than the D and D that actually exists. Mm-hmm. Uh, but over time, I found that what I wanted to do with the game and what Dungeons and Dragons does isn't quite wasn't quite syncing up so i'd always kind of wanted to do a new edition also it's been mm. it's close to 10 years now since i first started working on bugmire uh so i mean it's like you know now it's time to do a new edition uh and then right as we're gonna start crowdfunding um was the coast made certain legal decisions regarding the open game license that made it awkward uh-huh. for me uh so i i quickly took all the stuff off the shelf that I was on the fence about because I was like, I don't want, I wanted the original idea was it was going to be something closer to the first edition. And I was like, Nope, we're done with that. So let's Mm. pull that stuff down. Um, and so yeah. uh, now it uses uh, uh, the Onyx 20 system, which is basically me taking um, all of those ideas and just pushing it something closer towards uh, uh I guess an indie-ish fantasy experience. There's still a lot of classic fantasy gaming in there, uh, and also it is. I, mm-hmm. There's an entire appendix on how to convert uh, between both games. So, like, if you love the original game, you'll absolutely be able to uh, use that material in the new version. But it, it's a lot more just little things. Like, well, I say little. Uh, I, I gutted like the the math, for example. Because anyone who's run or played D&D, um, the math for monsters and damage is super wonky, right? Uh, um, it, it starts off mm. a little too hard at first level to become pathetically easy at high levels. And basically, if you don't have exactly four people in your party, the whole thing goes off the rails. Uh, and so I, I literally just recalibrated the top to bottom all the math on it. But I didn't. I tried to do it in a way that wouldn't be glaringly obvious, right? It's like, oh, this looks kind of like a stat block. I'll just use mm. this stat block versus the old stat block drop it into your game it should run fine but that was like a very kind of behind the scenes thing for me to do so since we played this you've had quite a few source books come out that introduce more to the world than just being able to play as the dog can you talk to us about some of the options that are now available one of the things we did was uh pirates of pugmire um, which is uh, a way to play um, as pirates in the water dog port area um, and also allowed you to play birds and lizards mm-hmm. or now reptiles um and so you could play as a, you could play as a turtle a pirate turtle if you want mm. to and that's that's amazing um we also did uh, squeaks in the deep which is uh, a source book for mice and rats and also uh, a chance for me to do something i've always wanted to do with my old school nerd cred is i want to do psionics in a fantasy oh, game because uh-huh. <laughs> i've never been happy with how psionics are done in fantasy games <laughs> um, it's like now is my chance and yeah. it's kind of like magic but different uh, but <laughs> <laughs> um and that was also kind of like our also our, my nod to uh the the old underground mega dungeons right mm-hmm. um uh, how to do those kinds of cool underground campaigns but without having a giant map yeah um but the big one was um we did monarchies of Mao, which is the cat game and that's 
uh, actually crowdfunding now a new version of that as opposed to it being a standalone game. It's now just a explicit source book for Pugmire. So it has all the cat information um, in terms of making characters. It has an entire new area of the world called the Monarchies of Mao, which mm-hmm. were the different six city-states the cats coexisted in kind of almost a um, Renaissance Italy style of intrigue and politics. Um, then there's three whole adventures you could play from first level all the way to about fourth or fifth level. Uh, so you have kind of like an entire campaign arc in there, all crammed into one book. So curious cat- Cats of Mao is getting ready to go into its crowdfunding phase. Where can listeners find that if they so desire to make a campaign where they can play as dogs and cats and rats and birds and turtles? I don't listen. I don't know anybody that listens to our show that probably wouldn't delight in making a group of those mix of animals. Right? Exactly. It's 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 every cartoon you ever saw as a kid, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, but no, it is on uh, Backerkit. Uh, at Backerkit, uh, over the past year or so, has actually gone into directly doing crowdfunding campaigns as opposed to purely supporting Kickstarter. Um, and they've been fantastic to us at Onyx Paths. Um, so it's going to be on mm-hmm. Backerkit. It's going to be through uh, the end of February into uh, late March. But even if you miss it, if you're listening to this uh, later on or whatever, um, pretty soon after those campaigns end, we do switch it to a pre-order system where then you can Again, right on backer kit, you still pre-order the book up until we shut it off when we get ready to go printing. Yeah, so if you are interested in finding out more about Pugmire, uh, you can find the link to the backer kit in the show notes for this episode. Uh, and with that, enjoy our one shot of Pugmire. Across the vastness of reality, a limitless number of existences play over infinite possibilities. These are the fragments captured in our rudimentary observation. Welcome to the Omniverse. Hey, everybody, and welcome to our next installment of Tales from the Omniverse. I am the Crit Show producer, Rev, uh, and today I'm joined by... Tass, hello. Hi, I'm Jake. And we are also joined today by a very special guest. You know, every one of these, I always say, oh, I'm, I'm really excited to have this person here. And it's true. But this is kind of special because uh, our guest today is someone who was very helpful when I was trying to figure out how exactly to start the podcast and figuring out games. Uh, it was someone that I had a mutual friend with that that friend got us working in the same room together. If you have played tabletop RPGs in your life, there's probably a good chance that you have played something that he has had some hand in somewhere along the way. Um, He has worked with Hunter the Vigil, Firefly, Mage the Awakening, Vampire the Masquerade, Pathfinder, Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, But today he is here to play with us his very own creation, Pugmire. Today we are joined by Eddie Webb. Thank you so much for joining us, Eddie. (laughs) Thank you. And I, I feel like, yeah, you really talked me up there. Now I have to live down to that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to walk us through this? Sure. Yeah. Let me kind of start with, with what the game is about. Pugmire is set far in the future of our world where humanity is gone. Uh, maybe they died. Maybe they went to space. Maybe they turned into a brain cloud and ascended. Who knows? Nobody knows. But uh, at some point in time, dogs and cats and some other animals were uplifted. They were change so that they can manipulate tools, they can talk, they can stand upright and and the like. But they've been left behind. And so now uh, these dogs are trying to understand the world that they are living in. It's about unknown number of centuries after humanity left. Uh, So the dogs are trying to kind of reconstruct the world as they understand it. And for the kingdom of Pugmire, where the game kind of generally starts, um, they have what's called the Church of Man, where they actually take the elements, the research they've done of, of humanity or man or the old ones or what have you, and they've turned it into religious doctrine. So like uh, uh, the old ones gave us certain rules to live by as good dogs. First one is be a good dog. That is the highest credo that man has dictated us, so we should be good dogs. Um, and there's also things like fetch what has been left behind and only 
you know, bite those that threaten you. They're trying to take the the understanding of, of the elements of the world that are left behind and, and try to make sense of it. And uh, some of the archaeology is wrong, which leads to potentially funny, but sometimes interesting dynamics. Uh, for example, all the technology left behind, they consider it to be magic because they don't understand it. So if they pick up a, a rifle, a laser rifle, and they shoot it, it's a wand of heat. I, I, I take this <laughs> wand and I point it at people and they become very hot and explode. Okay, well, then it's a wand of, it's a wand of fire. Um, you know, so dogs have learned how to cast magic, quote unquote, which is basically um, either adapting existing technology or they've internalized technology through some kind of, you know, perhaps nanites or even further weird science fiction tech um, and use that to cast magic. Uh, so throughout the game, I'll be using the language of Dungeons and Dragons um, and fantasy type games. But in the back of your mind, understand this is a very, very, very long post-apocalyptic Earth that has gotten just weird over the intervening millennium. Um, so all of you are playing dogs uh, to start with. Let's start with the mechanics first. Um, this is based on a variation on Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Um, so it uses uh, the open game license that can tweak and modify the existing rules to make it into a whole new game. So if you're picking it up, um, the, the Pokemon book is all you need to play it. Everything is in there. And I definitely went with kind of um, a streamlined version of 5th edition. So if you've played 5th edition before, a lot of it's going to be familiar. But I took out some rules, changed some things, kind of cleaned things up, but also I made some changes to reflect the kind of fantasy we're talking about here. In my mind, a game about anthropomorphic dogs that are trying to reclaim the earth and be good dogs is not going to do well as a game that incentivizes murdering people and shaking them down for loose change. <laughs> so, <laughs> as a result, <laughs> there are no experience points, for example. You just go up and level after an appropriate story. The currency isn't even tracked. You just have some coins, a lot of coins, many coins. It, it's, it's meant to, because in fantasy games, like the fantasy fiction trying to emulate here, how much money you have is kind of secondary to that. Uh, without going through all of the mechanics, the, the core things you need to know is that um, there are six main attributes that every character has. Uh, uh, strength, dexterity, constitution, wisdom, intelligence, and charisma. Um, you have a score, but that outputs to a, a modifier, which is a, a, somewhere between a plus three to a minus two. Um, you will roll a d20. You will add that modifier to the roll, and that is your default roll. So if I say you need to pick up something heavy, you will start sending a strength roll. You roll d20. You will add your strength modifier and tell me the number. If that equals or exceeds the difficulty, you made it. If not, you fail. If you have a skill, there are certain skills on your listener sheet, and they're, they're binary. You just either have them or you don't. Um, and also you have uh, tricks, which are certain things your dog can do as a result of what kind of dog they are or their their uh, family or what have you. And um, sometimes they'll reference uh, what's called the proficiency bonus, which means that as a dog, you are skilled at a certain level. Um, and so when you do things that you're skilled at, you get this flat bonus every time. Uh, so all of the kind of it's plus one for this, plus one for that, that all gets collapsed into a one straightforward thing. So if you're strong, you add your strength bonus. If you're strong and you're skilled in lifting things up, or you have a trick that allows you to lift things up, then if it says add your fishing bonus, then you get an additional bonus on top of that, you're more likely to succeed. Um, in terms of actually rolling the dice, uh, it's, normally it's 1d20. Um, if you have what's called an advantage, which is something in the situation means that you are more likely to succeed than other, uh, you're attacking from behind, um, you're for higher grounds, you have, you're a, a noble, you're trying to bluff your way into a fancy party, what have you, then you would roll 2d20s and choose the higher number. If you have a disadvantage, the opposite is true. If you're in a situation where you're on the back foot, you can't do well, you'd pick the lower number. If the final result is a natural 20, it's called a triumph, means you always succeed no matter what, and you get some additional bonus. Um, in combat, you do a little more damage, um, you succeed particularly well, what have you. Um, if you roll a one on the die, that is a botch, which means you fail no matter what, and something particularly rough happens. That's kind of the straightforward dice rolling. Um, in terms of some of the mechanics that changed specifically for Pugmire, um, the main one I want to touch on is called Fortune. Uh, in my hand, which of course the audience cannot see, but maybe you can hear, is I have uh, some fortune points. I have two of them to start with. Um, and these are in your fortune bowl. Uh, so anytime you uh, roll a die and you're just not happy with the die, whatever's on the die, uh, it could be an attack roll, it could be damage, whatever, but the, the die you're looking at, you don't like it. You can ask the group if you can spend fortune to re-roll. If no one says no, I take the fortune out of the pool, re-roll a die, and take the better result. 
you get fortune by playing into personality traits, which really ultimately boils down to if you do something that's really funny or you do something that's um, makes things harder for you but is appropriate to your character uh, or you come up with a really cool plan, whatever makes the game better and more interesting beyond just fight, kill, fight, kill, fight, kill, whatever, I will choose a time to give you fortune as a result of that, to add more fortune to the bowl. The idea here is that the early stages of the story, um, due to your character quirks and your decisions, you're probably going to make things a little more complicated, a little rougher. So you're building up a fortune pool so that way when the big fights or the big conflicts come later, you have more resources you can spend to try to overcome those bigger, more complicated situations. So things are a little rough at the beginning, you build up fortune, things get close to the end, the big situation, you spend fortune to get out of it. That's kind of the, how the dynamic works. Um, and certainly you can say things like, hey, my character should do this, but because my character will do this other thing instead, um, I think you should get fortune, so feel free to ask for fortune. But I've listened to the podcast. I'm sure this is not going to be a problem for you guys to generate fortune. <laughs> I know how this works. But those are kind of the, the high points of the rules. Do you guys have any initial questions about that? I don't think so. Yeah. No, it's all very, okay, cool. very straightforward. Cool. Um, and I'm sure as we get into stuff, um, uh, we'll uh, continue on in terms of how like combat works out, get that if and when there's fight. There might not be a fight. There's totally going to be a fight. <laughs> then to kind of start off, all three of you um, are, are dogs in the Kingdom of Pugmire. Uh, specifically, you are royal guards, but you're kind of an unusual group of royal guards. Um, you do help out with uh, the king, King Puckington, who is the king of Pugmire. You do help out with him. You do kind of act to protect him and the, the royal family. But you're also given a fair bit of autonomy. Uh, sometimes you travel outside the kingdom to look into things that might be long-term threats. Um, sometimes the king just asks you to go on special missions. Sometimes they're quiet missions. Sometimes they're, they're important missions. And so you've been labeled the itinerant Pugmire Travelers, or the IPT for short. <laughs> <laughs> This is going to be a good day. <laughs> <laughs> Research. <laughs> um, so uh, if you want, um, let me uh, start with Rev and work your way around. Kind of talk about a little about your character so everyone kind of knows how your Pugmire version of your character specifically is. Yes. Yeah, so I am playing Revington. He is a level three ratter. A ratter is, it is kind of your, your, your thief, your rogue, your Han Solo, depending on what vein you're going down. Mm -hmm. um, and my breed is herder and herders are always watching out for their friends, trying to help out, trying to keep people on the right path, even sometimes to the detriment of themselves and the group. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, uh, my my family, the type of dog I am, is a uh, a Canaan, and my background is noble. Uh, I am a uh, a brown haired Canaan with a a short bow across my back and uh, some some dark leathers on, um, and I carry a, a little dagger at my side. So as a noble rat, are you kind of more of like a um, Scarlet Pimpernel kind of character that you? By day you're noble, but by night you. It is kind of like a almost philanthropy that like oh I'm I'm my family is noble and I think this is a noble cause because um you know when it comes to traits the thing that is important to me is reclaiming what is lost being able to go out and find these relics and and use them to maybe teach people something or show them something new and maybe have a new understanding about something from the old world and then my bond is with is with the IPT uh, I didn't know that's what it was called but I, <laughs> I love know. It. I sprung it on you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then uh, my flaw, I'm trying to play as close to just actually being myself in Pugmire as possible. Uh, my flaw is that no matter what, I just can't, and then you have the prompt, uh, accept that I can't solve a problem. Uh, I will be playing Tasselhoff, and I am an artisan, uh, which is kind of um, like a, a wizard scholar. Um, the, what I'm leaning into in particular is that kind of scholarly aspect of wanting to find things from old, find the, the secrets of the old ones. I am playing, uh, a, the breed of a pointer, which I think feeds into that. The pointers, you know, they're kind of hunt things down. They want to find information there. Yeah. The collectors in that way. And the family is beagle. 
Um, the background I have chosen from this is Sage, which, you know, again, kind of also feeds into the idea of information gathering, collecting. You know, I myself, I have notebooks upon notebooks upon notebooks of just lore and other random things. So I've thought this, I mean, that artisan is me. That's what I do. And uh, so, yes, my beagle uh, self is mostly white fur, but with uh, the black and brown kind of patches uh, all over, uh, long floppy ears, like almost on the verge of uh, more of a hound dog. But um, yeah, he's a he's a little guy because I'm a little guy. <laughs> and um, uh, uh, but before we finish, I want to mention um, for artisans in Pugmire, they're kind of like magic users and also kind of like bards. Yeah. Um, in the sense that they can be inspirational, but specifically they channel their magic through an object, some relic of man that that allows them to empower them. So, do you have a specific object in mind for um, your 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 focus? I do. And I feel like an idiot because of this, because I was, I thought for a long time, what is this object? What could I possibly have? Like, what would it be? I have no idea. It's a D6. Nice. It's a dice. Nice. <laughs> Because I have a horde. Like, I practically, like a dragon, sleep on my <laughs> horde of dice in my room. And I'm like, what? What is an old, like, a plastic item from the past that I could have found? Of course it's a die. Um, so, yeah, I have this little blue and orange swirled die. And I have to say that at the time that we are recording this, the one that I ordered for this specifically should show up in about four hours. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sad. <laughs> but instead, he is using... Uh, Tass and I both uh, backed Pugmire when it came out on Kickstarter, and so Tass is using his Pugmire dice that nice. came with it. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, so with this in mind, um, what I took for my ideal is finding the secrets of the old ones. So just... I think that's what started me on this path as a, as a young pup was finding this die and kind of going from there. Uh, the bond is um, helping my friends when they're in need or in danger. Um, you know, I already know that they have kind of that same goal in many mm -hmm. ways. And I also struggled with my flaw because I knew it had something to do with me being just an angry little person. <laughs> and I think Jake put it best because the prompt is, no matter what, I just can't. And then you fill in the blank. And he says, well, it should just be, no matter what, I just can't. <laughs> 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 and that was too perfect so that's what i'm going Sweet. with uh i am playing jacob uh my calling is guardian which is sort of like a, a paladin protector fighter type uh my breed is fettel um fettles are sort of they're just kind of tough stalwart dogs they're the they're the like it doesn't matter how many times you hit the mat it matters how many times you get back up they're that kind of dog um, so very, very well constituted, very strong, a very sturdy dog. Um, I am playing a kind of Corso. Uh, so I'm a, a big kind of jowly. I'm, I'm toying with the idea of doing a real jowly voice this whole time, <laughs> <laughs> a wet jowly voice. Um, but real, real big, still got the floppy ears though. Uh, not like the, not like the clipped scary ears he still got his flop oh ears. nice nice um and my my background is common folk so i'm a i'm a very kind of salt of the earth uh you know down down in the trenches people like me people will uh look out for me if i need them to kind of dog um i wear heavy armor uh, a big big suit of armor and carry a war hammer and a shield. Um, my ideal, what's most important to me, is helping the helpless. Uh, and something that I just can't do is uh, give second chances. If somebody proves out the gate that they're untrustworthy, I am not inclined to change my opinion on that, no matter what they do. I dig it. Like I mentioned, you live inside of Pugmire. Pugmire is a is the main kingdom of the Pugmire Empire, if you will. Empire is kind of in quotes in this. Uh, there's only really one other major city, which is Houndton, which is to the south. Um, and there's a couple of villages, or not a large number of villages, but they're all like all over. But Pugmire is the main city where dogs live. It is known as the city of good dogs. Um, so it's, it's, it's the big metropolitan area. It's your, your water deep, if you will, that kind of place. And today is a citywide festival because today is officially King Puckington's birthday. And so to celebrate, all of the dogs are uh, off and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're drinking beer out of bowls, they're dancing in the streets, generally just having a good time. The princess of Pugmire, Princess Yosha Pug, uh, she is known to be very 
inquisitive, much like, like Tass. She likes to know things. Um, and in this case, she wants to go to uh, Riverwall, which is also known as the Cat Quarter part of town. So she can kind of celebrate to get to know other people besides the people in her family and in the castle. Riverwall is not the best part of Pugmire. Um, it's where the docks are. Um, so there's a river that goes to the east of Pugmire, and this is kind of the dock area. And so when cats started to kind of move to Pugmire along with other animals, they were kind of moved to the dock part of town where nobody else really wanted to live. Uh, so it is definitely not, it's not terrible. I mean, the, the living conditions are pretty good there, but it is a working class area. Um, there's a little bit of xenophobia on both sides. And Yosha's like, I want to go there. And so uh, the princess like, okay, you can go, but we would like you to take the IPT with you, please, so you don't get murdered in the streets during the celebration of your father's birthday. That would be great. Thanks. <laughs> um, so you have been voluntold to go help Princess Yosha during her celebration. <laughs> <laughs> and the place that you settle on is uh, Granny Sue's Roadhouse. Um uh, this is uh, someone that actually uh, uh, Jake's a little familiar with. Um, this It's run by uh, Sue Weimariner, um, and she is a tough-as-nails dog. She used to be an adventurer back in the day, but she's decided she's going to take her plastic coins and invest them back in the town and build a, a, a bar that she can run things. But also, being a tough-as-nails guardian-type character, aesthetics are not her high point. Um, so it's definitely kind of, as long as the table is flat and the chairs work, they're all kind of just thrown together and make it work. Because her logic is after a couple of drinks, no one's going to care about the decor anyway. <laughs> so as long as the drinks are strong and no one's fighting, everything's fine. As you kind of settle down, um, you're starting to kind of just hear the, the susurrus of people talking. This is definitely the kind of place where if you wanted to find someone in a cloaked figure in a corner ready to hand out missions, that would probably happen in a bar like this. Um, but that's not necessarily why you're here. Mainly you're here to kind of just make sure the princess feels like she gets what she wants, make sure nothing bad happens to her. Well, but also people are celebrating. It's a, it's, it's a party. So there are still people, lots of, you know, singing songs in the corner and slamming back drinks. So it's definitely a raucous, fun atmosphere, but also something kind of keep an eye on things. Um, so the princess kind of sits down and she just is happily right now just drinking out of a bowl. Is there anything you guys are doing while you're here? Anything you want to keep an eye out for? Yeah, I think just taking a peek around the room to see if anyone is not celebrating. Like, that sounds like a strange thing, but on, on a day of celebration, I'm always uneasy of the people who seem to be unhappy with the, the people who are out enjoying the time. Okay. Um, why don't you go ahead and make a uh, wisdom roll? Um, we can use... Uh uh, notice or any other skills you think might be appropriate. All right. And um, one of my tricks, actually, is uh, Keen Observer, Okay, which gives me advantage on wisdom rolls. Absolutely. So then go ahead and roll two and pick the higher number. Then add your proficiency bonus to it. Oh, sorry, your uh, wisdom bonus to it. 21. So at first glance, as you're looking around, um, nothing seems particularly odd. It definitely seems like people are talking amongst themselves, chat, you know, chatting, there, there's drinks going, people going to the bar and coming back. The dynamic in general seems positive. But when you start kind of taking a step back, as it were, um, and paying attention to how people are moving, you notice that um, one table near you is all cats. And then another table near you is all dogs. And a third table by you, um, a cat goes to sit down and then some, there's a discussion and the cat turns around and leaves again. There's definitely some kind of tension, but it's hard to tell if it is general dog and cat tension or something else. As a bit of context, at some point about roughly 30, 40 years ago, two generations ago, um, there was a, a huge war between uh, Pugmire and what's known as the Monarchies of Mao, where the cats live. And that's known as the War of Dog and Cats. Um, that war resolved kind of in a big meh. Um, both sides claim a, a, a tentative victory, but really it's just everyone got tired, stopped fighting, and the two leaders ultimately agreed to some kind of vague truce. Um, over the years, there's been attempts to try to increase diplomatic relations between dogs and cats, um, try to come to some kind of treaty, but they've always kind of fallen through. So there's still... Dogs can have cat friends, cats can have dog friends, that's certainly a viable thing, but there certainly is the average consensus that still that dogs don't really hang out with cats and cats don't really hang out with dogs. So this is not 
entirely unusual, but it is unusual to see it this starkly, particularly in the cat quarter, which is known to be a character that area that has cats living in dog society. Do you guys see that? That's kind of strange. You usually don't see that clearly divided of a room, especially in a place like this. Hmm. I mean, I wonder if somebody got uh, a little too rowdy or said something they, they didn't mean. Uh, yeah. Do they all seem to be drinking, at least? Yeah, for the most part. I don't know why that would calm me. That probably should make things worse. <laughs> Is yeah. everybody at least drinking? That'll make things better. No, I, I think I was thinking the same thing. Can I go buy two rounds at the bar? Um, how much uh, on your sheet you should have uh, uh, some number of plastic coins? What does that say? Or amount of plastic coins? A few. Okay, that's a, a, you can buy a rounds maybe with a few coins. Um, if you got if, if someone has uh, many, you can definitely get two rounds. Or if you guys want to chip a couple of people, you can chip in their few coins. Yeah. So, can somebody spot me? I can. I have many plastic coins, so I can chip in as well. Okay. Uh, what I want to do is go buy a round for each table and go specifically hand them to everybody at each of those tables and then stand in the middle between them and make a big toast to King Puckington. Don't really make a roll for that. Uh, it just kind of happens. So you go to, um, Rev gives you a bunch of plastic coins and you go to the um, bar, go to Sue. It's like, I want to buy a round for everybody where she's happy for business. And so uh, there's, let's say, besides you, there's like three rough tables. So you get like three big rounds. So you get the first one. Do you want to go to uh, the all dog table? Uh, there's one that only has a couple of dogs at it. And there's one that's all cats. Which one do you want to go to first? Uh, I think I'll do couple dogs, then all cats, then all dogs. So you get to the first table. You put the drinks down. They're kind of quiet. Um, as you get a look at me, they're definitely uh, dock worker types. Um, you get the impression that this is the place they always go to drink when they're off work. The fact that it's a festival is completely irrelevant to the fact that they're here today to drink because that's what their time to drink. <laughs> so they're, they're career. They're hardcore, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so kind of just, you know, nod, take the beer. Don't really say much. Um, they seem appreciative, but not really vocal. You get another round. You walk up to the cats. We'll say there's about five cats. And as you set the drinks down, they were talking amongst themselves. And then they kind of get quiet when you're set the drinks um, down. That's fine. I don't think I, I mean, I'm, that's suspicious, right. but I don't think it changes my course of action for the moment. Okay. Um, as you're looking at them, uh, make a uh, make a wisdom roll with notice skills. Uh, I do not it. have the notice skills, so okay. that's just straight wisdom then? Yep. Difficulty 12. 16. Okay. Um, the one thing uh, you notice uh, as you're kind of walking away is that all of them have uh, a bit of red coloring in their clothing. So they're all dressed differently, but all of them have somewhere, whether it's a, a scarf or a strip of fabric uh, or, or a color of, of shirt or pants, but all of them have co red coloring in all of their clothing. Okay. Then you get the third round and you go to the third table. Um, and again, it's a case where the dogs are talking amongst themselves. They seem to be joking and laughing, but when you come up, it gets a little quiet. It's not as maybe quite as suspicious as the other one, but more like, hey, what are you doing here? As I set them down, I want to just kind of shoot the shit and uh, try to get in everybody's good graces. It's a great day, isn't it? Great day for the kingdom of Pugmire. Great day to drink in the middle of the day, huh? And I like hold up my glass and take a big chug. All the dogs are excited about, yeah, drink it for Pugmire. And the cats are like, eh. <laughs> great. Yeah, yeah. So like, oh, yeah, this is awesome. We, we love we love the king. And we especially love that the king is going to give us a day off. <sighs> oh, yeah. Hail to any king who will allow us to day party. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and this beer going down the sides of their faces and... Getting everywhere. Uh, Tass, what are you doing during all this? I think I'm sticking with the princess. Okay. Uh, I think I'm just sort of sticking close and, you know, kind of keeping an eye on that and just seeing who she's talking with, if anybody, and, and just trying to facilitate the conversations and, and you know, try to give her the, the best time out here that's possible while also sticking close so that she's safe. Okay. As you're kind of sitting there and Jake's kind of going around spreading drinks, uh, she keeps looking back at the table of cats and they keep kind of looking at her. And she's like... She's not suspicious. It's more of the, you know, that look at dogs yet where it's like, I want to go talk to that person. And you hold on at least like, no, no, no. And they go, but I want to talk to that person right now. She has that look. <laughs> okay. Um, do you, do you want to go say hi? Yes, please. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, yes, I would like that, please. Well, yeah, let's, let's go. Let's go just say hello and see how they're doing. Okay. Is it okay? Because I don't want to cause any trouble. I mean, be prepared. They're strangers. They may not really want to talk. And if they don't want to talk, we, you know, we just nod and and go about our way is that okay okay yeah that's fine all right let's yeah let's just go give a little greeting yeah, so she uh, uh gets up and her tail is just going a mile a minute she's like oh my god this is so exciting <laughs> and so, so she walks over and um she stands for the cats and cats again kind of look and stare at her and and she curtsies 
Um, and she's like, yeah, my name is Princess Yosha Pug. Um, my father is the king, and this is a birthday today. And I just want to make sure that all of you are having a good time and that everything is okay. And uh, uh, Rev, because you've been kind of paying attention to the dynamic of the room, um, you get the sense that these cats don't know how to deal with this. Like, they're prepared for dogs being assholes, dogs being loud, dogs being jerks. They're not prepared for dogs coming up and being polite and civil. So they're kind of like to have it look up like, like you almost see the question marks over their heads. Yeah. And they're like, uh, thanks, dear highness. Highness? Highness. 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 You know, I'm thinking about as much as I can of, of this Rev having a lot of the same life track that I've had. And, and so much of what I considered like the noble background was studying the arts. Mm-hmm. And so it's a lot of people watching. And like right now to me, it seems like their response is not dangerous or threatening because they're kind of taken aback by the kindness. But do I get any sense from, from the table that it is not a genuine like, oh, we don't know how to react to this? I'm not sure if that question makes sense. Oh, uh, no, it does. Um, uh, given your training, you, as a noble, you've seen people like getting ready to have a, uh, an audience with the king and how uh, anxious and nervous they get. You've seen people who um, have been uh, abused servants of dog families or what have you. Um, so now that you're actually seeing some different reactions and a chance to study them, uh, you're definitely in the impression that they are anxious about something. They're worried about something. So they're being insular because for some reason, they're just seeing dogs in general right now as a threat. Yeah, I'm going to go up with them at the table. Uh, yes, this is, as she said, Princess Yosha, are, are you all having a good time? We want to make sure that, you know, everyone in Pugmire is is enjoying this day off. Uh, everyone seems a little uh, on edge. There's one kind of big tabby cat, um, and he kind of just sets the bowl down and is like, I never really got a taste for dog beer. I prefer catnip. Catnip tea. Oh, that's fair. I'm surprised. Do they not serve any here? I uh, don't. Never asked. Oh. You know, she's like, oh, I'll go ask. It just, boom, goes to the bar. <laughs> um, so she's right by you now, Jake. Um, and you can, and you kind of see, you're just finishing up the rounds for the last table. Um, and they're like, yeah, cheering. But you see like the, the princess just running right by you to the bar. Hey, what are you doing? I'm going to get some tea. Do you have tea? Tea, do you have tea? And Sue's like, what? Catnip, catnip tea. The, cat, the cats, they want catnip tea. So he's like, I don't. Maybe I'll look in the back. She goes, turns, and go around the corner to the kitchen area. And so you know, she's kind of standing there, just tail going. I will wait with her for the tea. When she goes away, does the demeanor of the cats change? Do they like follow her? Do they keep their gaze with us? They're keeping an eye on you more than them because you're the two of you are right in front of her, right in front of them, right? Yeah. Um, a couple of them are kind of keeping an eye on her, but more in the sense of what is she doing rather than we have to keep track of her for some nefarious purpose. Okay. Which is helping you kind of put things together. It's definitely more along the lines of like, why are these dogs talking to us? We just want to have a drink rather than malice. Okay. So it does just kind of seem like a, we thought this was a, a safe, comfortable place to drink and now we're being bothered right. by, okay. Okay. So if you're just kind of hanging out, Sue will come back with tea um, and hand it to Yoshi on this huge tray that Jake probably should pick up. It's probably a little big for her. Can do. <laughs> and then you all walk over to the table, um, and there's just five cups of, of steaming tea. They look kind of a, almost like a green tea in, 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 in te- color and texture. Uh, so, so they look kind of a weaker looking tea. It's not a, a thick color, um, kind of greenish, um, but it smells quite nice. Um, and then the big tabby cat kind of takes it and sniffs it and then drinks it. It's like, ah, there we go. That's better. Is that the good stuff? I've lived here for a while, but I still, the beer sits weird with me. Right. You know, I've never tried catnip tea, actually. He hands you the cup. I want to try it. It tastes like boiled grass. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. You got to take the back, and then he's, they're starting to get more comfortable. Um, and actually, the tab, he's like, why don't you pull up the chairs? And Yoshi immediately just grabs your chair, boom, sits down. <laughs> I'm doing my best to give them, like, encouraging but apologetic looks, like, you know, kind of... Sh- shrugging at the princess like yeah i see they're just like everybody else uh, sorry guys and just yeah trying to almost you know get on their side a little bit and um just watch what she does well um tash you've been around the princess enough because like you've uh because you're both artisans you both kind of talked theory and 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 shared information and whatnot um you know what like so you've been around her a bit more than the other two and you know that she is on the cusp of 
when Yoshis ask a question, it's more like a question tsunami. <laughs> okay. It, and it's, a, it's boiling up behind. She's trying very, very hard to be a good dog and hold it in. But at some point in time, she's going to ask a question and it's going to never stop. <laughs> oh, no. Do you let people know? Do you just let it happen? I think I almost, I think I look at these two almost for permission. Like, like I, I give them the, the high sign. I give them that it, it's happening. Do we abort or do we <laughs> <laughs> see what happens? Bail out! I have a question that I want to get in before she starts her word vomit. So okay. if I see that, I will just go. So are, are y'all coworkers or something? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, we just uh, came off a ship a few months ago um, and we've been living here ever since. Um, we're from... Uh, the monarchy of Korat. Oh, okay. Is that what the like the red on everyone's clothes indicates? Oh, yeah, yeah. It kind of points down to the shirt and says, like, "Yeah, that's um, that was our our house color. Um, was we don't we don't like to talk about it much anymore. Um, but we're he's he's clearly stumbling. Then the, a black furred cat, kind of smaller cat, uh, she kind of pipes up and says, um, "We're done with Korat." It's like, "Shut up!" And he's like, "But we don't want to go back there. Why? Why are you being weird about it?" We're still loyal to cats, and we don't share these secrets with dogs. And Yoshi's like, why not? <laughs> and the black cat kind of looks at the tabby and looks at Yoshi, and it's like, there's definitely now suddenly tension, because someone has to answer the question the princess asked, but no one knows exactly how to answer it. Hey, you know, it's, it's all fine here, because as you can see, and I'm also nodding at the princess, we're all just people. You know, it's this is a day of celebration. We're all out just folks having a drink, and that's fine. You know, there's no no pressure from us, so don't say anything you don't want, or, you know, if you want to talk about it, we're friends. So the tabby kind of looks at the other cats, and they're all kind of nodding. Um, and so he drinks the rest of his tea and sits down. He's like, all right, well, maybe, maybe it's time to talk about it. As he says that, the door slams open, and you hear a, a trumpet, you know, boop, and a cat walks in dressed in beautiful, like, uh, fabric, like a brocade coat, red and black brocade. It's got a trumpet with a flag hanging down to it with a red logo on it. And it's like, the dynast of Korat, Kir von Korat, it demands your attention. And it just walks out. Everyone in the, in the, in the place just stops. They have no idea what just happened. <laughs> Wait, wasn't that the place you guys were just talking about? Yeah, that's suspicious. And they start looking at you guys again. Real suspicious timing. But why don't you stay in here for just a, just a moment and we'll go out and see what it is. Like, are, are you guys in? Uh, this is such an odd question to ask, but are you in danger? Is there a reason that someone from your homeland would be hunting you down, looking for you? A black furred cat, she kind of speaks up and it's like, he won't say it, but I will. Yes, we, we know something that they want to keep quiet. We can take care of ourselves. And you know, she's like, no, we can help you. And and she's like, no, we, we'll take care of ourselves, but we could use help. Well, you're in Pugmire now, which means you're part of our city. So we won't let anybody take you or do anything to you without them having to get through a whole lot of us first. The other cats kind of just nod and drink their tea. Um, and, you know, she's like, yes, we should go talk to them. And just gets up and starts walking towards the door. Oh, uh, I, we're, okay. All right. <laughs> Yeah, quick, quick on her heels. Yeah. So you kind of go out outside, um, and uh, the area that the um, roadhouse is in, um, it's one of the main roads that leads pretty much down to the docks. So, like, if you just go out, take a right, walk down, eventually you'll you'll hit the river. Uh, so you can get a pretty good view of that normally. Um, but because there's the the festival going on, when you first got here, there were a lot of dogs and cats kind of in the streets celebrating, going to one place to another, what have you. So it was a very kind of busy time. Um, all of them seem to have been either encouraged or pushed and clear, but there's a clear line now in the road. Um, it looks like the people with the horns are going just to other people and go, you know, make way, make way. At the end of the street where the docks, you see a ship has been docked. Um, to notice before. Um, it is uh, a big, tall ship. Um, it has a nice plastic hull, which is common for uh, particularly well made ships um, because the water of the river and the acid sea are slightly acidic, and so the plastic hull keeps them from disintegrating the wood. Um, and so having the plastic hull in there is a sign this is definitely a very expensive ship. Um, you see flags. There's similar to the flag you saw hanging from the horn of uh, the original cat. Um, there's 
Again, splashes of red along the edges of the boat. Uh, but coming off the boat, coming down the street, there's a, a palaquin. Um, um, four big muscular cats are carrying this palaquin down the road. And the palaquin, you can't see inside of it, but it's um, got kind of a reddish wood tone to it. So it's that kind of like uh, cherry wood kind of texture to it. Um, but there's no windows you can see. It looks like it's all kind of closed up. And along the, and the edges of it, you can see, again, that kind of uh, the red symbol that you're trying to realize is the symbol of the monarchy of Korat is along the side. And you hear more of those people's horns like, make way, make way. And it's just marching down the street. And did all of those cats come out with us or did they stay inside? They're now, if you look over your shoulder, uh, they're behind you. They're out of the, the table, but they're kind of like looking around you. Uh, um Particularly with with Jake, he's kind of a bigger dog, so it'd be hard to kind of look around him. But um, uh, they're like wanting to kind of hear what's going on, but also not wanting to push past you. Um, I actually want to turn back and go inside, and I want to go up to to the to the black cat, the little one who kind of pipes up every now and then. Mm-hmm. Listen, I I don't know exactly what's going on, what you have faced, but if you have a secret that they want, the thing that makes a secret less valuable is when other people know it. All of the cats, so you say that all of the cats like wits. It, it, it's like you said something like culturally inappropriate. Oh. And it's like, but that, that, that's, mm. and then she turns to the bigger cat and is like, we're in, Dog city, we have to live by dog standards. Like, but what he just said, and it's like I know, but you know, we're we're in Pugmire now, and we have to. They do things differently here. They don't understand. And and she kind of turns back to you. He's like, I'm sorry. Uh, my name's Mickey, by the way. Hi, Mickey. I'm I'm Revington. How are you? Hi, hi, Revington. You clearly have not been around cats very much. I can tell. No, huh? Secrets are very important to us. Uh, we don't share secrets. Uh, it's it's plain. We just don't do it. A lot of our lives are based around making sure that information is protected so that it's not stolen or lost because humanity made us the guardian of information. If you want to, um, you can make a roll to see if that's true. If, if any of you have the arcana or history skills. If you don't, you can't make the roll. Uh, I've got history. Is that, uh, is that wisdom? Yes. Oh, sorry. No, uh, intelligence. Uh, difficulty is 15. Far too difficult for the likes of me. <laughs> With my with my four. How about you, Tess? I am I'm looking how Voracious Learner works again. <laughs> oh, uh, Voracious Learner, I believe um, you get advantage in your role if it's something you could have theoretically read before or heard about before. Okay, so would that count for this? I think it's fair. Um, if you've been hanging around with the princess a lot, you probably picked up some political stuff. Sure, that makes sense. Okay, so yeah, you can roll with advantage. Twenty. So uh, a lot of what was said is true, but not all of it. Um, the whole thing about cats keeping secrets, now that you start hearing, it's like, oh, yeah, I do remember reading something about that. Cats do consider secrets to be very, very important. Um, humans tasking them to preserve all knowledge, it's a bit shakier. Um, more accurately, uh, the general cat dogma, the cats don't have a unified church like the dogs do. So it's much more of a philosophy than a, a religion, per se. But on average, cats believe that actually humans worship them which puts them at odds with dogs because dogs believe that they worship humanity and cats are cool. So you worship us now, right? Eh? Eh? (laughs) I see. I see. By the law of transitive properties. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So uh, you don't get the impression that uh, uh, she's being malicious. Maybe just has bad information, um, but she clearly thinks that's true. Got it. Okay. I will, I will bank that for the moment. And so she's like, you know, clearly hemming and hawing. She really wants to say something, but she's also trying to explain why she can't say something. Yosha kind of steps up and grabs her paw and puts some biggest paw on her paws and says, whatever happens, I, you know, we'll do what we need to. If you don't want to tell us, that's fine. But know that I'm sure my father will do whatever it takes to help you. Uh, and she has the trick puppy dog eyes, which means that um, she gets to roll advantage on her charisma rolls. That's <laughs> so good. Um, and she has a 22. Uh, so, um, uh, Mickey finally goes, okay, okay, fine. Um, yeah, you, you should probably know. Um, and she looks around and the other dogs are like all paying attention. And so it's like, there's a lot of people here. She's like, but can we go to at least the back of the room and talk? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So in the background, you sit here, make way, make way. As you make your way back to the, um, back of the, the bar. And um, you basically go back to that table you were at before, but like, you know, now you're all crowded on the back of the table and so you can see who's coming in. So now you're starting to act as paranoid as the cats were um, when you first came in. But she's like, it is our belief that the Dynast has been taken over by some kind of force. 
We don't know much. We just know that they're advocating very hard for a new war with Pugmar. And there's no good reason why we should do that. We don't believe that there's any benefit for it. And the, our house has always been a house of warriors. We believe that um, we should clash and fight and whoever is the strongest will, will benefit. But this is something else. And the only thing I have is I found this. And she reaches into her bag and pulls out. It's, um, it's a big kind of plastic coin. Uh, it's old. It, it's been scarred and damaged. Um, uh, but carved into it, you see uh, a spider emblem. And she's like, something about these, this is important to them. Uh, so as you're talking, I mentioned um, outside, you were hearing the kind of uh, the make way, the horns and all that. Um, that is starting to turn into screams. Oh, Uh-oh. I will run out and see what's going on. The three of you rush outside and you see that um, the palaquin that was being carried, it looks like there's something kind of shaking inside of it. The whole thing's rattling and, and, and jostling around and a spider leg pops out from it and starts to burst through from the palaquin. The Crit Show is a Crit Show Studios production, edited and produced by Brandon Wentz with music by Jake Purley. You can find more information about us at thecritshowpodcast.com. To keep up to date with upcoming live shows, contests, and other special events, follow us at The Crit Show on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. For even more weekly content, join us at patreon.com slash thecritshow.